to talk about today was um, my pathway. And um, as you'll see from this slide, um, I've actually been um, at the university. Um, I've been at the University of Nottingham since 1991. Um, and uh, I did a degree in psychology, but I realized that the bit um, that was um, really interesting to me was a topic called ergonomics, which was about how we take understanding of human capability and use it to inform design. So I went and spoke to my lecturer and he said, oh, go and see my friend John Wilson um, because he runs this course called Human Factors in Manufacturing Systems. And so I went to see John Wilson and he was sitting in his office playing solitaire, surrounded by boxes. He'd just been promoted to a professor and sort of the rest is history. Um, and I was very lucky that um, uh, at the time my PhD was um, half funded by the Health and Safety Executive as a case award, looking at this new technology called virtual reality and how it might be implemented in a workplace setting. So my PhD was about designing technology for implementation in a workplace setting. I then have moved my career um, looking at uh, transport technologies, um, particularly um, initially in the railway industry, um, uh, looking at um, manufacturing technologies and do a lot of work currently on digital manufacturing and also in healthcare, particularly looking at um, uh, medical work, so outside the operating theatre, but how hospitals work and how we might use technology to support hospital activities. Throughout all of this, and I was asked this question at my interview to be a lecturer um, in 1999, it would have been that interview, and they said, you know, what's what's your thing? What's your thread through your career? And the interesting thing is it stayed the same, which is it's about design of novel technologies for complex work situations. And one of the things I've been quite fortunate about is that thread. So the academic discipline that I'm interested in, which is about how we understand and use methods to understand work with complex technologies, has enabled me to move between a number of domains. And that's not always, always the case with careers, but it suited my personality and also strategically has been quite helpful because as you may be aware, finance for research sometimes moves between different areas depending on government priorities or industry priorities. And so I've been able to flex and move with different funders along the way. Um, and as you'll see from the photos, I've put on weight and lost weight and put on weight and lost weight um, and, uh, um, and had two children and gained a husband who I've managed to retain um, along the way. So when I was first asked to do one of these presentations, I thought, well, I, I have no idea how my career sort of maps against other people's careers or, you know, what it is that made a difference or what it is that, that sort of shifted things along. Because um, I, I have, I now have the confidence to say that it seems to be going quite well. Um, I, um, you never quite know what the future brings, but, um, but in terms of probably quite a traditional academic career path, um, I've managed to um, so progress through the academic ranks. Um, it is worth saying I got an academic post very early, possibly too early, um, but um, uh, they needed some teaching doing and I did the teaching. And then actually um, uh, one of my colleagues went off sick and they need me to, needed me to cover and he never came back. So I had a very unusual start to the career, a little bit of precarity and contract over that time. Um, but, uh, but in 2000 got a permanent post, which was quite early on um, in my career. Um, and I had um, two children along the way. Um, uh, and actually, one of the big things that switched things for me was that in 2008, 2009, I was part of some consortia um, that were enorm that were awarded some very, very significant um, sized projects worth 18 million. A centre for doctoral training that I supported the training for um, and a large multidisciplinary hub. Um, that made a real difference and I think really accelerated that move between senior lecturer and professor because of that big substantive grant um, portfolio, as well as some other grants through industry and other activities that I was PI on. But most of my money still is as co-investigator, not as principal investigator. Um, so I looked in comparison to some other people and they were very kind to share their own trajectories. And all you will learn from this is that there is no pattern. So I got people to tell me when they had their children as well. Some people had their children early on um, and they um, uh, uh, sort of did postdocs in industry, lectureship, um, professor, 
Um, some people started and then they had their children um, slightly later. I can't even remember who these people are now, actually. Um, uh, certainly, I think the only consistent pattern I picked up from careers is getting a big win and making the most of it. And it's not enough just to win the grant. It's to make the most of the grant when you win it. And then the other thing that I've just picked up from anecdotally speaking to colleagues um, is that someone's got your back, that you've got someone you trust. Um, they might be your partner. They might be your PhD supervisor, my PhD supervisor, who he sadly died in um, uh, 2013. And actually, at the time, I was absolutely devastated, but I also reflected on how fortunate I was to have had that partnership and that support um, throughout my career. And I'm sitting in an office surrounded by many of his books that I think I'm sadly going to have to throw out some of when I move office in a few weeks time. Um, but uh, but I feel very proud to have had that support and that partnership. Didn't agree with him most of the time. And I still think as I'm making difficult decisions, what would John think? And then I sometimes do the opposite. Um, but having that, that sort of really trusted, honest person in your life, maybe professional, maybe from a personal point of view, um, is something that I think just if you've got one of those people, just just cherish them um, because they're really, really valuable. That person will tell you the truth uh, when you don't really want to hear it. They're really important people to have around. Um, and you'll see as well, um, I was quite quick, but not the quickest in terms of um, being promoted. It's not a race. Um, uh, I think the only thing I'd say is that um, uh, it. If you've got the opportunity, go for it and don't think that you have to tick all the boxes before you apply for something, whether it's a job in another university or whether it's a promotion. Um, as you know, get some trusted advice from someone asked me this last week. Am I making a fool of myself applying? Um, and just make sure that person is really honest and says yes or no and, and tells you the truth. So I did want to reflect on um, a couple of things around my personal circumstances, and this isn't really an EDI talk, but I get asked this quite a lot. And I've actually tried to distinguish between being a woman in a, a discipline where women are underrepresented and being a parent or someone with care responsibilities. And I, I should probably change this slide, actually, because sometimes care responsibilities are not about being a parent. They're about having other members of your family that you care for or even friends that you care for. And the first thing is there is inevitability that if you are a woman who happens to give birth, then you will have to take some time off work and that will impact on your academic career. Um, uh, however, it doesn't need to be a negative. Um, and I, I don't think, you know, we can't change biology um, uh, in that particular context. So, you know, let's just accept that that's something that, that is going to happen. Um, and actually jobs of people like me is to make sure we take that into account fairly when we are judging um, promotions or research grant applications. And to give you some assurance, the world has really changed since I had my kids in that fair consideration of maternity leave and parental leave and paternity leave and even long term sickness leave and things like that. Um, certainly the process we have at Nottingham, but also I've seen in the research council context, people think really carefully about how to fairly take that into account. And, you know, you can't imagine that during that time I was off work for six months, I would have written a Nobel Prize winning piece of work, but you can make sure it doesn't disadvantage me um, in terms of, for example, the quantity of publications or activities I might have achieved during that time. Um, maternal guilt um, is again something that you won't avoid. Um, one of my most cherished friends um, is someone who's a full-time mum and I was talking to her about this the other week when we were quite excitingly going out for a drink with our, our children for one of the first times ever. And um, I reminded her how valuable she'd been as a friendship to me because in the kindest possible way, she was occasionally equally as hopeless as a mother as I was. And it made me realise that all mothers occasionally mess up. Um, and uh, she was always very good at not judging me for being a working mum, rightly, shouldn't be judged, but I judge myself all the time. Um, but also just reassuringly slightly useless occasionally. Um, and uh, we're all slightly useless. We all mess up. Your children will tell you it's all because you weren't there when you were working. You just have to um, just sort of get over the maternal or paternal guilt. Um, you become very good at juggling when you have care responsibilities. Um, and, uh, um, and actually that can be a real asset. You can become very efficient in terms of your ways of working. Um, and again, 
Um, I've never missed my children when I'm at work because my children have never been to work. Um, I miss them when I'm in the house without them being around. It's been very strange and actually very joyful for me in the last year having them around the house. Um, and uh, when they're not there and it's me and my husband working at home on our own, we feel bizarrely and irrationally that the house is very quiet. Um, but I never miss them at work. So I think it's that, that sort of juggling that um, uh, is something that you need to learn to be an asset. Um, and then just from a practical point of view, I did not travel transatlantically for, I think, at least seven, if not longer years, if not more. Um, I think it might have been 10 years, actually. Um, uh, my children are 17 and 14 now. Um, uh, and I limited my travel uh, from a European point of view. I'm really focused. It's when I started working with EPSRC um, was when um, uh, I had my second child and I didn't want to do European projects anymore. Um, it's personal choice. Some people choose that, but it was it was something that played out for me in that way. Of course, I am also um, a woman academic um, and there are some systemic challenges that we still see within academia and within industry to a certain extent as well. Um, we tend to be given the pastoral roles. Um, it's happened less to me as I've got more senior. Um, I've, I've been attracted to the pastoral roles. Um, I think just deciding whether that's okay or not if you are a woman um, and if you're not a woman, then um, again, not feeling like you can't do the pastoral roles, I think is 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 just as important as well. Um, early on in my career, I don't think you can say this now, I generally had a bit less of an ego. And I was okay with that, but I didn't push myself quite as much. Um, and uh, um, that was just something I observed was different about me. Whether that's to do with my gender or not, I have no idea. Um, I did... And this is a genuine meeting that I was at, by the way, and I don't know if you can see me, but it was a meeting where I always used to wear a pink top because I knew everyone else would be wearing dark suits. Um, I was noticed. I People remembered me, even being called Sarah, the most popular girl's name of my year of birth, um, uh, because there weren't many of us. So actually, if you are a bit unusual, if you've got an unusual name or you have a different protected characteristic from those around you, Yes, it can be hard, particularly in those sort of coffee conversations and feeling like you stick out, feeling like you look different. Um, but you are noticed as well. So feeling confident about being noticed and making a positive of that can be really valuable. And then a really interesting one. If any of you have seen the film Singing in the Rain, sorry, because I'm going to spoil it for you. Um, but um, uh, one of the premises is that one of the characters has a very squeaky and slightly unpleasant voice. Um, sometimes as a woman, I'm probably doing it now, I go a bit red. Um, sometimes I cry in meetings. Um, uh, sometimes my voice gets very shrill um, if I'm very animated about things. Um, it's just the way we are. Um, we're just different. It's why it's really important to have diversity in teams so it doesn't stick out so much. But again, don't worry about it. But it is something I've noticed that is different and it frustrates me, particularly the crying. Um, uh, really does does annoy me. Um, I did want to talk as well. I think I, I think I was going to miss this slide actually. Um, no, that was the one I thought I deleted, but I failed to delete, so ignore me. Um, right. I wanted to reflect moving beyond the protected characteristics in uh, choices I've either accidentally or deliberately made that I'm happy to be questioned about. Um, the first is I've had a very multidisciplinary career. You can see that was the same slide as before. Um, so that's the other thing. If you make a mistake, just fess up and move on. Um, it's something I've, I've absolutely learned in life. Um, being multidisciplinary in my career, and I know that many of you um, working with the Connected Everything Network will be having exactly this challenge now. Um, I sometimes used to look on my colleagues with much neater and tidier CVs. Let's say um, they were particular experts in um, uh, one particular um, uh, type of um, uh, civil engineering intervention or one particular type of um, uh, challenge in power electronics to do thermal management in power electronics. One of my colleagues does that. Brilliant, brilliant career. And when you meet them at the party and you say, what's your research specialist? They'll say, thermal management in power electronics. When you meet me at a party and ask me what I do for my research, you, you need to go and get another drink before I finish my answer because there's so many differences um, in terms of my research. Um, and that means that my CV is a little bit all over the place. I don't have that same narrative that you might have if you've done something sort of quite neat and tidy and really sort of developed in depth a particular um, sort of area and delivered those advantages. Um, 
it, again, it's sort of a choice. It was a deliberate choice from my perspective. Um, it was something I enjoyed. I like working in a team as well. Um, uh, and I have enjoyed learning from different domains. I've occasionally had to step back. At one point, I did have projects in transport, manufacturing and healthcare all at once. And I simply couldn't keep up with the industrial context. So I sort of had to drop one and then pick up another and things like this. Because you have to do that industrial engagement. It's a bit easier now with teams and things. But um, but uh, but but I think you need a little bit of focus. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend you go quite as broad as me. Um, the other thing is, I quite soon after I got promoted to professor, did... I'd already been leading my research group by that point, and I'd led a few cross university things. I discovered I quite enjoyed leadership. Um, I was talking to someone earlier. I sort of discovered that every time I moaned about something, someone gave me the job to fix it. Um, and actually, I've really taken that forward. And whenever anyone moans at me, I'm like, brilliant. How are you going to help me fix it? Um, and that's something that's worked for me. Not everyone enjoys all of those aspects of leadership. Um, there are bits of my job I don't enjoy. Um, but um, so so I think finding the bits you enjoy and seeing what the career path looks like for those bits you enjoy, but not feeling like you have to be like me or any of the other people you see around you. Think about your own path and what that might look like, um, I think, is, is an opportunity. Um, I am a people person. I like nothing more than a good chat. Um, I have been incredibly grateful for the people I've worked with. Um, and this photo here is of the Human Factors Research Group at the point when I was leading the group. Um, I sort of stepped back from that a few years ago now. Um, and um, that group um, and many other groups that I've worked with, the Horizon Digital Economy team, the Connected Everything team, the team I work with on the digital I'm also already seeing the team merge at the Department for Transport, um, the team I work with in delivery of EDI. I'm a real sort of people person. and. And I really, really value the diversity that different people in a team bring. Um, if you're sitting here thinking, oh, golly, I'm a bit of an introvert. This feels a bit intimidating. Being a people person doesn't mean you need to be an extrovert. Um, and I actually really enjoy the diversity of different personality types within the teams that I have, um, as well as um, uh, the, the sort of uh, the, the extroverts. Um, uh, because um, actually you don't want too many extroverts in a team. It causes chaos. So so you need that sort of balance and that mutual respect between lots of different people um, uh, within the environment and to have that inclusion of all approaches, all seniorities um, uh, and all um, sort of specialisms from a research point of view as well. Um, I've been lucky to have some role models. So this is a photo. I'm the baby. That's my mum, my grandma and my great grandma. Um, I think she died just before I just after I was two, I think. Um, and this is the only photo I think of all of us. So my mum was a computer programmer before I was born. Um, and um, I didn't always get on very well with my mum when I was growing up, actually. And she um, she died when I was younger, um, when I was um, in my 20s, my late 20s. So that's quite young, really. Um, but she was a role model in her intellectual engagement and her debate. And my grandma was as well. Um, and there were certainly no gender specific expectations placed on me um, as I was growing up. Um, and there was certainly no question that as a woman, I would have to take a different path or anything like that. Um, and I think I probably didn't appreciate at the time, actually, because I was a grumpy teenager, um, the, the sort of role models that I had in front of me. Um, and, and I really do appreciate it now. Um, patience is really important, just taking time. And I have had to learn explicitly to listen as much as I talk. Um, and some of you might have to learn to talk as much as you listen. Um, but we all have to learn something and none of us are good naturally at everything. Um, and actually having fun is really important. So um, these are, I think, my kids and my nephew on my brother's new sofa. Um, and if you choose to or have ended up having kids or have kids in your life of any sort, then and that's what you want. That's brilliant. And that is as important a part of my life as my work and the people in my work environment are. Um, and um, but also just getting the enjoyment from whatever aspect of your life. 
um, is incredibly important. Um, I am very lucky that I cannot remember a day when I have woken up and thought I don't want to go to work. Um, and actually, I, I, this isn't about giving advice, but goodness me, if you're lucky enough to find something that you enjoy doing, grab it and keep it as much as you possibly can. Um, something I now take incredibly responsibly is not pulling the ladder up behind me. I've been very fortunate to have lots and lots of support from people along the way. Um, and I actually had a slide in my presentation that I realised was so outdated that I didn't want to show it to you because I'd upset so many people who now help me. Um, so, you know, there are so many people who've helped me along the way. And I now make a real conscious effort to do that myself because I reluctantly accept the position that I am now in. It feels incredibly arrogant to talk about myself as a role model. And I'd never do that. But I sort of have to accept that that's what's happened. Um, so therefore, there's a responsibility. You may all be in a position of responsibility where you can help other people out. And it doesn't need to be a formal mentorship relationship. It could be just an informal chat or something like that. Um, and finding out what it is that people need help with um, and often giving people confidence. And along those lines as well, um, within particularly academia, we have to deal with failure. Um, we apply for, and, and there is a way of thinking about this, if we're not failing, we're not trying hard enough, we're not aiming high enough. Um, but it can be really tough and it can really hurt. I still get papers rejected. I still get grants rejected and it still hurts. And too right, it hurts because I put the effort in. But one of the things I have learned is which efforts to put 100% effort into, which tasks to put 100% effort into, and which ones I've realised it's OK to put less effort into, but without making sure that has repercussions on other people um, uh, unnecessarily. Um, I have mentioned some inspiring role models here, and I just want to mention there are four women here, and they are all women. If you ever come across Sue Black, she's a computer scientist. Um, I came from a middle class, white, um, privileged background. Sue did not. Um, and just look at her Desert Island Discs on the BBC or something like that, and you'll hear her story, and it will inspire you. And I'm very lucky to call all of these people um, my friends. Stacey Johnson, um, this week in uh, the University of Nottingham, we are very proud to announce that we were awarded bronze for our race equality charter, which means that we've done a very large piece of work around race equality. And I co-chaired that with Stacey Johnson. And she is an incredible individual who has been an advocate for um, black inclusion in the nursing profession. Um, Kelly Veer, um, both Kelly, in fact, I think all of these people have MBEs of some sort. I can't remember if Janet got an MBE or not, um, but she should have done. Um, and uh, Kelly has led the technicians commitment, which has single handedly, um, with lots of support from other people, raised the profile of and the value of um, uh, technicians in research across the UK. And sadly, my colleague Janet Fawkes um, died several years ago now. Um, Janet was a world champion balloonist. Um, she was an academic in the mechanical engineering department that I worked in. And um, I remember talking to Janet as she was she was dying of breast cancer. Um, Goodness me, she had a healthy outlook on life um, and she had had a load of fun. She was pretty annoyed that she had cancer, um, but um, she had a lot of stories and a lot of tales to tell and she wasn't bitter. Um, and her outlook and her putting life in perspective taught me an awful lot and I still think about that. Um, something that might feel uncomfortable. Many of us are not very good at shouting when we've done well. Be proud of yourselves. Be proud of what you've done. Be proud of your achievements. Um, be proud of your kids. Um, I'm very proud of my kids in their outlook on life, um, their challenge back to me, um, their um, attitude of inclusion and acceptance, actually, um, their interest in politics. Um, at the moment, I'm very proud of their interest in the European Championships as well, because um, that's really cheering up my husband. And you can see it in his face The, the for once we've got this family that loves football. Um, just be proud. Don't be don't be all modest about it. Um, you don't need to go and be horrible and arrogant, but but just being proud of yourself and giving yourself a bit of a pat on the back. And then finally, aiming high. So this is the little story I'll end with. When I was five, I got given exactly this train set. And we have this weird thing that I now look back on and realise was weird in my school. Well, we all had to sit round 
and we had to tell each other what we got for our birthday. You had to sit next to the head teacher and you stood up and you said, this is what I got for my birthday. And I did this and I said, I got a train set and all the kids started laughing because I was a girl um, and I got a train set and I loved that train set. It didn't let me put, be put off that train set. Well, this year I got my dream job. I already had my dream job and I got another dream job. Um, and I just think that, you know, this was a job where I absolutely had to give myself a talking to and go for it and sell myself and, you know, put my heart and soul into it. And I went and got it. And, and I have absolutely no idea what the future brings, but I'm really pleased that I went for some things and I took that risk of failure and I have failed, um, but it's really nice when you get it. So um, that's all from me. I'm very happy to um, take any questions. Thank you.